photography research and a senior staff engineer there. And okay. what we're showing here at uh, the RSA conference is some of the things we've been playing around with in the lab. We've, for a long time, we've worked in terms of side channel and power analysis and how a device, when it's operating, manipulating secret keys, how much power it uses reveals the secrets that it's working with if it's not properly protected. And not just the power, but correspondingly, the radiation that comes off of the device is very similar to that power trace and can be also used to extract a device by analysis. So what we're showing here are some of the things we started to play with in the lab and said, well, we know well about the, the smart card space, the financial space, but let's take a look at some of the common mobile devices that are out there now. So the high-end PDA in my hand, we've got a, a pretty high-end mobile phone here. Quote unquote and, a high-end PDA, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get we don't want to beat up on any particular That's vendor. Our nameless. Okay. Any any particular vendor is gonna have sure. the same type of issues if they don't have countermeasures in place. Okay. And that's really the story here. So we wrote our own application that does some crypto. Just like if you were making a mobile banking app or you were making any application and you wanted it to be secure, you'd put some cryptographic processing on it. So we used the standard library and we made a little app where you could set a few bytes of key and then you can run the cryptographic operation on it. And in okay. this case, I'm gonna pull the signal out of this by using a radio. Okay. So when I start the cryptographic operation, you'll see on the screen here a frequency graph and you'll also see a time-based plot of what's going on in the device. So when I start the operation, over there you'll hear the clicking and you'll see the patterns going by on the bottom. I'm gonna turn the volume turn so you're actually doing differential power analysis right now? Um, we're actually just recording the traces now. We're okay, just recording. This is simple power analysis. I can show okay. you the DPA as well later. Sure, I'd like to see both if you don't mind. So in this case, it's even when we get, we get five, ten feet away from this antenna, we can still hear the operations going on over there. So you can actually scan it from that far. That's actually interesting. Boy, the smart grid security world would find this very interesting. So if we take a look at what we record over here, so we recorded that. We used a combination here of a, a very simple receiver we bought on eBay for a few hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, also using that a combination with GNU radios, the USRP. So uh, uh, you're on like a, what, under a thousand dollars on equipment? Absolutely. And what we did was we brought the trace across. So I'm going to show you uh, what that trace looks like for that device. And we can see there's some gain settling. But we see the individual cryptographic operations here. Each one of these is one encryption. So each one of these is a cryptographic operation. Yeah, each of these little blurbs. So if I really if I zoom in on one of these. I'm gonna zoom in on one, okay. Oops, sorry, I didn't get the zooming center, let me do it this way. Okay. I can see that this operation starts pretty much here. And I can see, you know, you might to the entry and I think these are just a bunch of peaks, they don't make much sense. Mm -hmm. But I actually know that this op we programmed it up, it's doing elliptic curve cryptography. And that's done in the naive implementation, a straightforward implementation with a series of doubles and adds. Okay. And so I know it starts with a double, and then there's a different timing here. If I look at the timing gap between one set of operations like this, these two peaks here, it's a pretty narrow gap. Right. And I see that narrow gap repeats here. And uh, then I see the next gap is a little longer, and then narrow. And that really corresponds to reading off the bits of the secret key. So I can yeah. really say this is zero, one, zero, zero, one. Wow. I'm actually reading off the secret key from something that was operating five, ten feet away. Uh -huh. I recorded just, in this case, I'm looking at a single operation, and uh -huh. the entire key comes right out of it. So you can actually tell me what the key is. Yeah, I was just reading it off there. Zero one zero zero one. We have a handout here if I want to take. And it shows us decoding it. And it's the same story on, on this device. Um, in this case, we're using a magnetic field probe, and we can record an RSA operation. And I can show you very similar traits from it. So the, the lesson here is that if a device is not protected against side channel analysis, it's running a good cipher. I can't open up the device and, it, and its keys out, but it leaks its keys through its power usage, and that power usage results in RF radiation. So something I find realized is like quite a few PDA makers actually um, include uh, technology and chips that uh, can protect against uh, side channel attacks, but yet one thing people have to understand is oftentimes the applications themselves don't utilize right. the chip. So they could put some sort of hardened core in there to right. do an AES or to do an RSA operation. Right. But if the app developer doesn't know the right library call any of the programs. Or if the PDA maker doesn't allow the access to the API, 
which is actually often the case with some PDA mare crews. Yeah, I can see that being a problem. Yeah. So um, that, that's SPA. We call it SPA because it's a single trace mm -hmm. or a pair of traces, and we can really quickly, from one operation, read off the key. Right. Differential power analysis is another technique that's more statistical in nature. And what we've done here is we've asked this device to do a series of AES encryptions. We've given it a block of data. It's doing AES in CBC mode. It's chaining each AES operation. It does AES after AES to uh, grow to, like a network encryptor. AS256? Um, in this case, it's AES128. Okay. And it's running on an FPGA. So does it matter if it's 256 or 128 in this case? In, in, in that case, all it would do is double the length of time to get us the key out. Okay. So the extra 128 bits is not making a 2 to 128 factor. Uh -huh. It's making a linear doubling factor. That's okay. how that works. So what we have here is the entire operation. We can zoom in on the scope and see we can get back to the individual AES operation. So this is 10 rounds of AES operating on this FPGA. Right. And of course, we've recorded many, many, many operations in a fraction of a second here because that's how you'd expect uh, something operating as a network encryptor to work. Mm -hmm. Get rid of the other plot here and go back to that one. So if I take a look at the results from that, well, if I do AES, what happens in AES is though even though it's a 128-bit or a 256-bit long key, the algorithm says take 8 bits of key, mix it with 8 bits of input, put it through an S-box. Well, now I, I can attack it by looking at the power. I don't have to guess all those bits of key at a time. I can guess those that key 8 bits at a time. And I can use the power traces to act as an oracle and tell me if I've guessed correctly or not. So it doesn't matter if you're using cipher block chaining or uh, or feedback mode or doesn't make any difference. No, it might we might craft the attack a little bit more. So in this case, we're using CBC. It allows us to do some things in terms of operations quickly. There are even attacks against things like counter mode, where I don't need to see the input or the output from the chip. All right. In this case, we're going to see the cipher text out of the chip. That's not anything anybody's trying to hide. But knowing the cipher text and the algorithm, I'll be able to predict part of the key based on a guess part of the key, make a prediction of an intermediate, and use the power traces to tell me whether I've made that prediction right or wrong. And how that works is that we've got a whole series of operations. Let's say I have 10,000 operations, and I predict a bit that should be occurring on it for a pertinent key guess. For this key guess, with that ciphertext coming out, it should be a one, put it in this pile. Mm -hmm. For this key, key guess, it's a zero, put it here. And I have a lots of different ciphertexts, same key, and for each prediction, I decide whether it's in one of two piles. Right. Now, I make 256 key guesses to guess eight bits of key at a time. Right. If I guess wrong, well, then I've got pretty much the same signal in two piles and different noise, and when I subtract them, I'm going to get just pretty much noise. But if I guess right, all the ones are going to be in one pile, and all the zeros are going to be another. And if the device uses a different amount of power to register a one or a zero, even if it's a minutely different amount of power, after averaging tens of thousands of operations, when I take the difference, I'll see moments in time where that actual value, the predicted value, occurs. And that's exactly what we see here, is that we've done various different weighted averages for different key guesses, guessing 157, 158, 159, 160. When the right key guess comes along, it's there. I see a very strong power signal. So no correlation for wrong key guesses as I go through the different guesses, but a strong correlation for the one... <laughs> The one value that's got the right value. Yeah, so 169, and we're guessing from the end here, byte 15 of the 0 through 15, or 16 bytes worth of key. Right. I've already gotten out 8 bits worth of the key. And to keep doing this, I just go along and I go to the next byte of key. So I'm stepping through the remaining guesses for that byte. I can in turn now go to the next byte of the key and look for the one of the 256 values that's a long peak, a strong peak, and that would be right there. So um, I'm, a, I'm assuming that uh, anti-DPA and anti-simple power analysis methods really only work at a hardware level, right? They use a combination of hardware and software right. techniques. We generally recommend a combination. Uh -huh. This graph I've shown that for each of 256 guesses in each section uh -huh. here for each byte of key, there's really one strong peak showing me the right answer for each of those 256 guesses. And since I've gone ahead and if I continue to run the demo here, It's plumbed through, and in this case, I'm going to get probably about three quarters of the bytes of the key right. 
So you can see I know what was actually programmed in there. And it starts A, B, C, D, but actually I've guessed 27 C, D. So every fourth byte of the key in this particular demo, I might have to try a second or third guess. I have some weighted guesses here. Mm -hmm. We can actually correct for that with some knowledge about the device ahead of time. So using what we call templating, we took this device or another similar device and characterized it. We can use that templating to refine our guesses and actually speed this computation. But the countermeasures are a combination of reducing the signal so we can balance the circuitry in the, in the device so that it doesn't use more power for a one or a zero. But there always will be some leakage. We can add noise so we help to bury that in and make it so that we have to grab more operations before we can mm -hmm. see it. The real techniques that start to adjust, uh, make things more difficult is to mix in randomness. So if every time I touch the key... It's so what's the randomness based on? Uh, temperature? Uh, any sort of pseudo random number generator as long as it's not, not correlatable. Right. Now when I use the key, I always mix the key with a different random number. It looks different every time. It makes it much more difficult to attack. I may have to, an attacker would have to use information about when the random number is combined with the key as well as when the random number is removed from the operation at the end. So I guess the question I would have is how would somebody know if they're like, for example, looking at a hardware security chip, if, some, if they're getting something that's a true random number generator or... Okay, that's, that's really a separate question for DPA. Sure, sure, sure. How do you know the quality of your random number generators? Yeah. That's, that's a big theoretical discussion. Sure, sure. In terms of, and it's better to know the source and trust right, the source. Right, right. Sure, really I understand. Right. So you want to go you want to go with somebody that's well-known in the industry and not and just any fly-by-night chip maker, for example. Right, and it's the same story with the countermeasures. We license the countermeasures, the fundamental patents that right. protect against these types of slide channel sure. analysis. And I'm well aware of that. I work with a lot of chip makers. <laughs> the highest yeah. level is to do some sort of protocol level count. Yeah. So even if I leak out a little bit of information in each transaction, yeah. if you have a robust way of changing the key that has yeah. no correlation to old keys, then if I change the key every 10,000 operations, and after 100,000 operations, the attacker can get the whole key, after 10,000 operations, they don't have enough bits, and you've moved on to an uncorrelated key, and you do that in a robust way. Yeah. That's a protocol counter level countermeasure that on top of sure. software and hardware can really be very effective. Well, great. Thank you so much. Really, really I appreciate you. it.